from WHNT, Channel 19, the news leader in the Tennessee Valley. This is News Center 19. Rape, theft, burglary, hostage taking, one man did it all in one weekend. He's behind bars today, but will he stay there? Good afternoon, I'm Karen Tarika. Welcome to News Center 19. Shannon Dale Dean is behind bars in Florence for a weekend crime spree. Today, he faces 22 felony charges stemming from his wild weekend. Charges include raping an 18-year-old woman twice at knife point, stealing three cars, burglarizing four homes, holding three people hostage, and leading police on a high-speed chase into Tennessee. Additional charges could follow as well. An assistant Lauderdale County prosecutor says Dean may have been trying to kill a man who had filed robbery charges against him last month. A judge has decided to deny bond for Dean, who was released from prison last May after serving less than two years for five felony convictions. A car crash in Hazel Green yesterday claimed the life of a Hazel Green teenager. Today, investigators are sorting out the details trying to find out why the 15-year-old was driving without a license, a car that didn't even belong to him. Toronto Robinson was killed in the crash. The car he was driving, striking another automobile head-on at Charity Lane early yesterday. Another Hazel Green man, 69-year-old Clarence Rowland, was critically injured. The owner of the vehicle was on an out-of-town business trip. Authorities in Chicago say the gunman who shot two people and himself at the federal courthouse was shot by a security guard during the incident in an underground parking garage. An FBI official says 34-year-old Jeffrey Erickson freed himself of his handcuffs, took a federal marshal's service revolver, then shot and killed another nearby marshal. Another security guard shot Erickson in the back. Erickson fired back, killing the officer before he killed himself. The shooting came after the sixth day of Erickson's trial for eight bank robberies. A Pennsylvania woman has been sentenced to life in prison for killing her lover during a dispute over hot dogs. 29-year-old Lizetta Waynes of Pottsville admitted that she stabbed 67-year-old Joseph Ouellette because he refused to cook hot dogs. His decomposed body was found about a month later in April of last year. Haynes was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced yesterday to life in prison without parole. Well, the deadline nears for qualifying for municipal elections. Candidates must sign the forms and pay the money by today. This morning, another mayoral candidate qualified in Huntsville, local realtor Leon Crawford, paying his $200 and signing on the dotted line. Huntsville Mayor Steve Hedinger says he plans to qualify this afternoon. The other two candidates, Jimmy Wall and James Steele, have already qualified. The municipal elections are August 25th. Republicans say they want your vote in November, and it looks as if Alabama could become a major battleground in the presidential sweepstakes. Vice President Dan Quayle is already set for two campaign appearances this summer in Alabama. He'll be in Birmingham Sunday and return to Alabama in August. President Bush is expected to make at least one campaign stop here in Alabama. This year's campaign is relying on television in unusual ways. Ross Perot launched his brief presidential bid on the Larry King TV talk show. Vice President Dan Quayle scored political points, blasting a fictional television character. But that's not all. Dana Tyler reports the fictional character is striking back. It matters when primetime TV has Murphy Brown. It all began in May when the vice president criticized the Murphy Brown character for, quote, mocking the importance of fathers by having a baby without getting married. I better warn you up front. I'm not going to be like other mothers. I don't cook or sew or make stuffed animals talk in funny voices. At the time, the show's creator, Diane English, called Quayle hypocritical, asking whether he would have been happier to see Murphy Brown have an abortion. But that's not the end. English confirms that the show will open its fall season with an episode called Murphy's Revenge, in which Murphy takes on Quayle. English would not reveal the plot, but said she was offended by Quayle's suggestion that she's part of the cultural elite, saying, quote, the vice president lives in a big house, has a lot of money, wears very expensive suits, and comes from a family of newspaper heirs said English to be singled out as this evil person who's tearing down the moral fabric of America was very upsetting to me and my family and I thought it was enormously irresponsible and very political. A Quail spokesman today accused English of distorting the vice president's words and told Channel 2 News that English quote was trying to capitalize off the controversy for ratings. Well, there's no campaign today in Georgia. The campaigning is over and voters are making congressional primary decisions. A federal court ordered new congressional districts and the election. The Justice Department sent in 81 observers to make sure the voting is free of racial discrimination. 
Travelers, several major airlines want your vote. Call it this summer's Sky Wars. Airlines maneuver to take you almost anywhere in the world. That's coming up next. And later, a new strain of AIDS that may escape early detection. Are you at risk? Changes in the air, and it could mean easier access for you to international destinations. First off, U.S. Air will have some British money behind it. The air carrier, which serves Huntsville through a Charlotte hub, will be part-owned by British Airways. That gives British Air a foothold in U.S. traffic. Northwest Air, which serves Huntsville from a Memphis hub, is part-owned by KLM Royal Dutch Airlines, and KLM may get an unusual advantage. They're trying to get direct access to several secondary markets for direct international flights from the United States. And there's Delta Airlines, a mainstay throughout the South. Look for a meeting next week between Delta Management and the Airline Pilots Association. Delta is turning to their pilots to help the airline through a financial slump. When you travel by airplane, you have to buckle your seatbelt before you take off. Well, in Alabama, you're supposed to do the same thing in your car, but many people aren't. The state's new seatbelt law went into effect Saturday, and already dozens face fines for not buckling up. State troopers say they issued 52 tickets and 71 warnings for seatbelt violations over the weekend. If you get caught without your belt on, you face a $25 fine plus court cost. Well, they can make a meal look like it cost a fortune. Just add mushrooms. If the big, strange-looking mushroom varieties in the supermarket have you confused, listen up to Mr. Food. Sometimes we get confused about mushrooms, and with so many different types on the market shelves, it's easy to see why the confusion. I mean, what do we do with this one? What do we do with that one? Well, the mushrooms we're most familiar with are the white mushrooms. Well, they might be beige in color also, depending on the variety. And we cook them whole, we slice them, we chop them, we eat them raw in our salads, and they're very mild in taste. And today, they're even coming to us already sliced and already ready for the microwave. Now, the white oriental enoki mushrooms. They're usually eaten raw on our salads, too, because they're tender also. But then we run into the large shiitake mushroom, like these, and the funny-looking oyster mushrooms, like these. And we think that we might eat those raw also. Well, we really can. I mean, they won't hurt us, but they wouldn't be as tender as the white ones. That's why we should cook them. Then are we in for a treat. Yes, they're a bit more money, granted but they don't shrink as much in cooking. We'll have more left to enjoy. They're more meaty. There's something to bite into. And they're much more flavorful. You know, like, like mushrooms used to be, the real good taste of them. And they saute or broil up so easily. Just slice them and away we go. And in broiling or baking, the slices are a reward, like, like when we want mushrooms for an omelet. A few sauteed slices of shiitake or oyster mushrooms, they'll think it's a meat-filled omelet. But you get the picture, shiitake and oyster mushrooms, when you want the mushroom taste for a real, ooh, it's so good. Well, if the summertime heat has you down, pack up your winter woolies and look for cooler weather. In the Minneapolis area, they're complaining that it's too cold. The upper Midwest is shivering through an abnormal summer cold wave. Jackets and sweaters are a daytime must, only the brave are daring to head for the pool in Lakeside around the Minnesota Twin Cities. Mike Motley joins us now with a look at our own weather forecast. Hard to believe up there it's too cool for the pool considering well, our temperatures. I'm sure they have good reason to complain because people say in Minnesota there's only two seasons. There's July and then winter. So <laughs> winter. it's another one winter all year round. No winter-like conditions here. It's going to be just warm and summertime. The summertime in the south. We'll talk about your forecast uh, after this. Under a mix of sun and clouds, temperatures are in the mid-80s. We're at 85 in Huntsville. The Shoals at 86. Humidity in the 60 to 70 percent range. Winds out of the south at six mile, or five miles apart in Huntsville. They're calm in the Shoals. Temperature pressure is a falling right now. Well, in the southeast, uh, not much change. We have high pressure slowly moving out of the region. A stationary front approaching the valley in the southeast will uh, spawn some showers and thunderstorms this afternoon. Nothing on Doppler right now. But we should see some activity later on when the afternoon heating comes into effect. Clouds, uh, heavier cloud cover was along the Gulf Coast and going back into southern Mississippi and Louisiana. More showers along the Ohio River Valley in between Cincinnati, Louisville, Paducah, Kentucky. Clear skies for the most part in the Volunteer State and in the heart of Dixie, in the northern part at least. On the National Composite Radar, showers along that uh, cloud 
cloud cover in the stationary front. Showers around Bloomington and Indianapolis, Indiana. Some more showers in southern Illinois, southeastern Illinois. Pretty uh, dry in Alabama the last uh, couple of days, and most of the shower activity along the Gulf Coast around Mobile going back uh, towards uh, Louisiana and Texas. Heavier showers back into Denver, Colorado yesterday. Two inches of rain in around an hour, so lots of urban flooding in the expressways and streets around uh, metropolitan Denver on Monday. Tonight, we're looking for lows in the, right around the 68 to 70 degree range uh, for the northern part of Al Alabama, the southern southern central portion of Tennessee. And for tomorrow, we're looking for similar temperature bands into the 90s and much of the southeast. A little band of uh, 80s drops down to northern Georgia, around Atlanta, up towards the Georgia and uh, Tennessee state lines. The 100s back into, te uh, not Texas, but Arizona once again. It's always into the triple digits in the southwest this time of year. Nice band of 70s uh, from around Illinois back to the U.S.-Canadian border and up into Canada. Tomorrow's forecast the map calls for not much change. That stationary front zigzagging through the midsection on the Ohio River Valley and back into the plains and the Rocky Mountain states. Low pressure cells will spawn some showers in Texas and parts of, uh, that's not Texas, that's Colorado and Wyoming. Showers in the Texas too from a weak trough. Some more showers in Oklahoma. We'll see shower activity in the valley too. Only 30% tomorrow, but we should see some off and on for the next few days as the system uh, moves through and we'll probably expect uh, some better conditions, at least less rainfall on the weekend. Sun and clouds this afternoon. Our rain chance is 50%. Winds of the south from 5 to 10, a high right around 90. For tonight, mostly cloudy skies, a 40% chance for scattered showers and thunderstorms, or you can call it rain. It's about the same thing. Light winds are low at 72. And then for tomorrow, your hump day forecast. A mix of sun and clouds, our rain chance at 30% for a thunderstorm or two. A high near the big 9-0 for tomorrow with winds out of the south at 10 miles per hour. For the next five days, highs around the upper 80s to around 90 degrees, lows from around 70. To 75. The rain should hopefully end by Friday. We'll get a pretty warm and hot and sun and cloud filled weekend. Today's umbrella winner is Heather Ashley, who lives over on Sand Mountain in Section. All right, sunny so weekend. There it is. Sounds As of nice. right now, it can always change. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mike. Well, the debate over the dangers of secondhand smoke continues to heat up. The Environmental Protection Agency holding hearings today on the dangers of tobacco fumes to those who don't smoke, like children. A report that the agency is considering says the smoke is harmful. If that report is approved, it might just pave the way for more smoking bans in public and workplaces. Now, the town of Gunnersville may be a step ahead of the game. The city council last night banning smoking in city buildings unless it's in a designated smoking area. Also, it's banned in city vehicles if more than one person is in the car. Well, delegates to that International AIDS Convention in Europe are hearing about new studies, new techniques, and new predictions. But here at home, there's a new concern about the spread of a very mysterious strain of AIDS. Yeah, normally after being exposed to the virus, it would show up in a test three to six months after exposure. But this new virus, if it exists, won't show up on any known test. It has started showing up in doctor's offices around the world, though. So far, the CDC reports six American AIDS patients have developed the disease, three from transfusions, one from IV drug use, one a health care worker, the last one unspecified. The transfusions were done after blood banks started testing for HIV in 1985. Even the most sophisticated genetic testing shows not a trace of HIV in the blood of any of these patients. For there to suddenly be a new strain is a, a bit baffling, but in one sense, not really all that surprising. We know that the virus has the ability to mutate um, in the body, and that's what causes such a problem with a vaccine or a cure. A Newsweek article discloses the new findings. A spokesman at the Centers for Disease Control confirmed the information today. When asked whether the small number of cases could be a quirk or an aberration, Chuck Vallis said, there is something to it, but what, we don't know just yet. The most critical aspect certainly will be testing the blood supply, and, and that's what we would be most worried about at this point. It puts the Red Cross in somewhat of a quandary. We haven't seen the information at our national headquarters and uh, don't know what impact it might have on Red Cross, so it's really too early to say anything about how it might impact how we do business. The Red Cross knows it shouldn't impact donations. They point out people who donate blood have never been at risk for contracting AIDS. As for people who need surgery in the near future... You need to have confidence in the Red Cross blood supply because it is safer today than it's ever been. Certainly hope so. The Red mm -hmm. Cross does a lot of do a lot of good, work. and it's important to give blood. Certainly is. Amy joins us now at the calendar, and we're talking about the Americans with Civil, no, Americans with Disabilities <laughs> Act that is part of it's already into in effect. Right, and another big portion of it goes into effect on Sunday, and we're going to talk about it next. Stay with us.
going to the movies, out to a restaurant, those are things most of us take for granted. But for some 43 million Americans, there's often barriers in the way. We're talking about dis disabled Americans. This Sunday, a major portion of the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 goes into effect. Joining me to talk about some of the changes is Dr. Jean Bryson from UAH. You're also a member of the Huntsville Advisory Commission on Accessibility. Jean, right. thank you for joining me. Thank you. What portion goes into effect this Sunday of the Disabilities Act? The provisions relating to employment go into effect this year. Specifically, those, those businesses that have 25 more or more employees come under the, under the employment section of the, of the Act. Two years from now, July 26, 1994, uh, businesses with 15 or more employees, you can see that they're uh, trying to uh, give some leverage to small businesses. What are some of the things that the businesses have to do? What, what are some things that you see? Okay, well, 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 the key issue here is that they have to provi provide a reasonable accommodation to someone who, who is seeking employment uh, with, that with that organization. A person cannot be, uh, an otherwise denied qualified mm -hmm. person cannot be denied uh, a job opportunity on the basis purely of their disability. Again, I want to emphasize an otherwise qualified person. So there's, there's no quotas or anything like there's that? There's no quotas. You don't have to uh, 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 hire someone just because they have a disability. That's, that's a key issue. And so many people think of people with disabilities as someone in a wheelchair, but there's many, many disabilities that this covers. I think that's very important, and each one is unique. Each one has their own needs, just like in my situation. I don't, I can't understand and appreciate all the, uh, particularly the subtle uh, barriers that people, that blind people or deaf people or people with various disabilities have. It's a whole different world. How do businesses find out about, you know, th there's hundreds of pages to this act. How do they find out what they need to do? A lot of need for technical assistance. The place that I would go is the Huntsville Rehabilitation Center on Johnson Road. Uh, they n will have some of the answers, but they can certainly direct you p people who have the answers. There's much going on th in the way of educational programs to help businesses uh, uh, to meet the, both the letter and the spirit uh, of the law. So there's a lot of, a lot of help out there. By the way, I might mention, there are a lot of opportunities. This is going to be an interesting thing, too. There are a lot of opportunities for small businesses to get into new services. For example, there are going to be some needs for innovative approaches to providing accessibility, and new devices and so forth. There are small business opportunities in providing these new kinds of devices and services and so forth. It's a real unexplored area. It'll be very interesting to see. Thank you so much for joining me. We'll talk to you a little bit later on Newsmaker coming up. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Back with sports in a minute. Stay with us. Steve Johnson joins us now with sports. It's really becoming agonizing watching the Atlanta Braves, hoping that they'll stay in the race. Well, they have two and a half months left to go. <laughs> <I know. laughs> they're so close. Each and every game. That's right. It, it, they keep winning. Unfortunately, the team they're chasing keeps winning. <laughs> but checking in on the Atlanta Braves, idle last night and losing a half game to Western Division leading Cincinnati as that team knocked off Chicago. Braves play this evening at St. Louis. Meanwhile, the Huntsville Stars hosting Birmingham last evening in a game to the, losing the game rather, by a 5-3 count. Highlights for the good guys though, David Hockus, two-run homer, his fourth of the season. The Stars will play the Barons again tonight at Joe Davis Stadium, go out and see them. Well, no doubt SEC basketball fans will remember Alec Kessler, an all-conference star for the Bulldogs just a couple of seasons back. A guy figured to be a for-sure pro star. The only thing, it hasn't worked out that way. The mere fact that Alec Kessler, a veteran, is in rookie camp indicates he's struggling. But just over two years ago, Kessler was the all-time leading scorer at Georgia. The Heat had high hopes. But despite some flashes of brilliance, Kessler has been a big disappointment, seeing limited time and averaging just 5.3 points per game last season. Kessler got into kind of a mental rut last season, too. He would come off the bench cold, wouldn't hit any baskets, the fans would get on his case, and it kind of snowballed the whole season. And by the end of the year, it was, uh, you know, it continued to get worse. It, it, uh, and it really affected 
affected my confidence as a player, and I think for me to be a good player, I'm going to have to overcome that, the negativity of the crowd. No doubt the fans were on him a little bit last year. He's going to have to overcome that, and the only way you could overcome that is with good play. Kessler is using this camp to work on his physical game. The mental part will have to wait till the season, but he's not ready to throw in the towel. I guess if you have a happy life in general, you just, uh, you know, keep rolling through those things and uh, do your best to, to work through them. Working through those, of course, now this guy's not having a good time, but he's making a couple hundred grand a year, so it's, it's worth not, it. Not all bad. What a trade off. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Stu. Okay. Well, later today on News Center 19, look for solutions to a couple of major questions. First off, what's behind the deadly accident yesterday in Hazel Green? State troopers and other agencies are mounting a major investigation. They want to know about a 15 year old driving one of the vehicles. And how close are we to a major contract announcement for the Star Wars program? That's later today, be beginning with New Center 19's 5 o'clock live. And finally today, you may wonder what novelist and humorist Mark Twain would say, but picture this. Take one of his famous books about life along the Mississippi. But then for a movie, change the locale. Make the film along the Tennessee Tom Bigby waterway. That's exactly what movie producers are doing for Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn. And instead of using Hannibal, Missouri for the hometown, producers are deciding between Natchez and Columbus, Mississippi. Just enough to make a literary purist a little bit upset. That does it for us here at New Center 19 today. I'm Karen Tarika. For all of us here at the New Center 19 team, have a great afternoon. We'll see you again tomorrow.